I feel like, and check me, y'all. I feel <laughs> like it's really Anissa Asabi George that's swimming in her own lane in this race. Again, when we think about differentiating herself on the police issue um, with the school committee, with pushing for um, mental health providers or social workers in schools. I think, I think she's the, the one. I would agree with that. That's, that is kind of how it shakes out because I feel like John Barrows kind of swims in between some of these lanes a little bit, whereas yeah. Anissa is kind of, you know, and, and just especially in this very progressive leaning field, that's how it's played out. I definitely agree with that. Welcome again to the Scrum GBH's Politics Podcast. I'm Adam Riley with my colleague, Soraya Wintersmith. Soraya, how are you? I'm good. What's going on, Adam? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> In this episode, we are going to size up who the various candidates in the Boston mayoral race are catering to as they head toward the September 17th preliminary election. It's going to win the field down to two people. To my mind, and Soraya, tell me if I'm wrong here, if you just kind of skim the surface of what the candidates say when they're on the stump or in a candidate forum or talking to the media, you might come away with the idea that they're pretty much of like mind about the big challenges facing the city, how those challenges should be addressed, and by extension, which voters they're talking to. But then if you dig a little bit deeper, these very important, but occasionally somewhat subtle differences start to emerge. Am I overstating the commonality, do you think, or is that a fair assessment? No, I don't think you're overstating the commonality at all. Um, I think that when I try to think of the race as like a big Olympic pool, and if all the candidates were in different lanes swimming side by side, they're all doing different strokes, I guess, to your point about who they're talking to. Uh, I think in the case of John Barrows, he was pretty well poised to pick up Walsh's mantle, but hasn't caught fire. Anissa Sabi George seems to be picking up where Walsh left off. And when I think about Kim Janey kind of building her campaign um, as she's finishing Walsh's term, she's kind of complicated. And then, of course, there are the two that got in the race before Walsh left, uh, Michelle Wu and Andrea Campbell. And is it fair to say that, as you'd expect intuitively, since they were the ones who said that they were going to run against Walsh, if need be, that they are the most eager when it comes to repudiating Walsh's legacy or saying he didn't do enough in certain key areas? In keeping with my analogy, yes, they are swimming against the Walsh tide in a lot of ways. <laughs> I like the metaphor that you've created. It's very <laughs> rich and complex. I should mention that you did a piece on this a while back for GBH News. So these are not brand new thoughts. You've dived into this in greater detail. Let's get Peter Kadz in here, who, as many listeners will know, is your editor, Soraya, also my editor. Um, and Peter, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that one of your big contentions about the race as we head toward the prelim is that the complexity of Janie's position, as Soraya put it, has intensified in recent days, right? Um, yes, it's gotten more complicated. Um, the acting mayor can swim in any lane she wants. Um, she's, not, she's not bound like the others. Um, Wu and Campbell are bound very much to the progressive lanes. Um, the uh, uh, other two candidates, Barros and Asabi George, certainly are uh, swimming with images of Marty Walsh in their head. Um, I would say until recently, so was uh, Kim Janey. But uh, she recently broke out of her lane, or actually I should say, she breaks out of her lane when it suits her purpose. And of course, since her purpose is to snag the mayor's job full time, uh, that makes perfect sense. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, her recent uh, rather radical and unexpected action of throwing Boston's Harvard development plan right into the water. And we've got some slides so we can let the people um, 
know what we're talking about. Now, the harbor development area um, is uh, 40 plus acres that runs from the Rose Kennedy Greenway right to the waterfront. And when Janie pulled her surprise move, um, she immediately either KO'd or put on hold Don Shafaro's um, plan, which has been many years in the making, to build a 42-story 42, uh, 42 skyscraper um, right on the waterfront. Uh, there's another plan to put a hotel up uh, on the old Hook Lobster, uh, lobster store site. Now, Janie, you know, really attracted a lot of headlines with this. Um, I, I would say it was a, a, a classic political move. She made the announce, her announcement was full of rhetoric, almost totally devoid of facts and uh, an explanation. And she more or less just said, I'm doing it because I can. Now, there's a, there's a plus and a minus in this for her. To the business community, um, it's a signal that Boston's heading back towards the bad old days where, you know, years and years and years of planning um, can just be dismissed with the snap of a finger. Um, to progressive voters, especially those who are green, you know, this is like Janie walked across Boston Harbor herself um, to smite these two big buildings that are going up. To continue now, our aquatic metaphors, yeah. Nah, it's, yeah, Soraya saw that got us stuck in this. Um, the, the thing is, there's much more to it than Don Chafaro's plan <clears throat> and the lobster site plan. If you uh, go down to the Fort Boyd Channel area, there's a series of much more modest proposals that have uh, also been scrapped here. Um, I, I think there's a real serious question as to whether this is good public policy or not. It's certainly good politics for her. But let me point something out about Janie. Janie makes a lot out of being acting mayor. And the precedent the Janie people cite is, hey, Tom Menino made a lot about him being acting mayor. Tom Menino was acting mayor for six or seven weeks. Janie's been act is going to be being acting mayor for what? I'm guessing like around six months. You can make a lot more mistakes or you can just piss off a lot more people in six months than you can in six to seven weeks. But again, to, you know, let me give you one more example. And then All right. I'll, and then I want to push back at a statement you made earlier, but go ahead. Well, push back now. Push back right. now. I wanted to push back at your statement. And I know you were speaking somewhat loosely, maybe hyperbolically, but you said that when Janie announced that she was nixing this plan, she said she was doing it because she could. My sense, and I didn't cover the event, but my sense, and maybe Play you'll help me go after our shared editor here. My sense was that she said she was nixing it because development in that area and in the city as a whole has been far from equitable for far too long. And that she wanted to make sure that this big new re-envisioning of Boston's Harbor um, would be equitable in a way that past development had not. Am I right there? Yeah, but she gave no specifics. She didn't say what was inequitable. Um, uh, zero specifics. She used a lot of rhetoric. She made it very clear that um, scrapping the Boston Harbor plan was part of a larger effort to fight racism in Boston. And what she meant by that, I presume, is to, to make the waterfront a friendly and welcome place to people of all colors and from all neighborhoods. But there was a lot of sentiment, but very little um, in terms of specific plans. Gotcha. She, she didn't even mention Don Chafaro's extremely controversial, um, or oh, one-time controversial plan. But let me give you another example, and that's a fair pushback. Um, it, and this shows how the mayor, again, can swim in any lane she wants. A couple of days ago, uh, progressive candidate Andrea Campbell said the mayor should impose a citywide um, moratorium on evictions. 
Guess what? 24 hours later, Mayor Janey took Campbell's advice, of course, made no reference to, to the fact that it was Campbell's idea. Now, I'm being a little unfair here. Boston mayors, especially Tom Menino, would steal other people's ideas and give them no credit whatsoever. But if you look at the sort of headline she gathered, um, when Janie made her announcement, she made the front page the upper right-hand corner of the globe. When Campbell made her announcement, she got the metro front of the globe. And I must say, I give uh, the, the globe great, great credit. They recognized that this was a serious proposal and they gave it you know, pretty good play. But the difference between the metro front and the real front page is considerable. And that's all due to Janie being acting mayor. Let's say that's it for me. Want me to kick it back to Soraya or to you, Adam? Which way well, do we go? I, I just, I was hoping that, that Soraya was going to give me cover after I stuck my neck out to disagree with you by doing something oh, similar. That's... But she's apparently, I want to point at her correctly. She's going to leave me high and dry. So I think, I think that's it. Soraya, last call here. Come on, you don't get to shoot at me in public very often. It's true. That is absolutely right. The only thing that was percolating in my mind is that the window for Janie to call the shot with the development plan was kind of open by the lawsuit that was brought where a judge said, hey, um, uh, our Department of en uh, Environmental Protection kind of punted a decision to a secretary who signed off on it and the judge said, no, this isn't okay. Go back and make sure that you do it the proper way. Had that not have happened, there wouldn't have even been an opening for Janie to weigh in and distinguish herself. That, uh, you know, <laughs> Soraya, that's, that, that's fair comment. That's fair comment. Uh, the, the issue is, um, is this something that had to be done at that moment? I'm gonna just reach for a note here because I, I wrote the, you know, um, uh, the standard for an acting mayor taking, you know, a, an aggressive move is not admitting for delay. An issue was so pressing that it's not admitting for delay. Now, there are people who will question the legality of her uh, ban on evictions, but uh, I think very few would question you know, the timing, that is not admitting for delay. Um, now, Janie made a big deal. Um, and if I were a politician, I would have done this too. Uh, she cited the um, UN climate change report, you know, said, look, the clock is ticking way too fast. The planet's going to burn up. I'm not sure that fits the, the city charter's criteria of not admitting for delay. I'm not sure if uh, a delay of a few more months um, would ca cause Boston to burst into flames and sink into the ocean. But of course, the, the catch there is, you know, the city charter says she can only act on things not admitting of delay, but then she can do whatever she wants. And if someone thinks she's exceeded her authority, they need to find a way to challenge her. And that hasn't happened yet. So correct the mundo, Adam, because if she's elected, people don't want to be on her wrong side. All right, Peter Kadzis, thank you for these insights. Now I want to bring in two other guests. Today we are also joined, in addition to Peter, by Erin O'Brien. She is a Associate Professor of Political Science at UMass Boston, and by Lisa Kaczynski, the author of Politico's Massachusetts Playbook. Guys, thank you both for taking time to be here. Fun to be here. Thank so, you. Uh, can we keep running with various aquatic metaphors or do you want to switch <laughs> to maybe, I was thinking race cars earlier on and, you know, lanes. Uh, now I'm an open water swimmer. So okay. I, uh, this I got. We can, we can stick with that, but feel free to introduce your own, <laughs> you know, overriding overarching metaphor if you want. Uh, when you guys look at the race, which specific groups of Bostonians do you see the various candidates attempting to pitch themselves to. You know, Paul McMorrow, the, the reporter uh, journalist who used to write for Commonwealth Magazine, he's now, I think, gone into the government side. He had a great turn of phrase in the 2013 election in a piece he did for Time, which was something like, Marty Walsh has put together a coalition of voters 
whose only uh, shared quality is that they are Marty Walsh supporters. He put it more eloquently than me, but it's stuck with me ever since. So Aaron, when you saw the field, who are these candidates going after? Well, and I think it's apt to point out that the Walsh coalition didn't know they were a coalition. They never hung out together, right? Um, I've seen plenty of a uh, uh, truck with a uh, Trump sign and a Marty Walsh sign. And guess what? Those two don't like each other, <laughs> policy or otherwise. And so, and then also remember, you know, running against Tito Jackson in 2017, Walsh carried all but two wards of Boston. He got the majority of the black vote, a thin majority. Um, so Marty Walsh brought together people based on personality, based on um, they liked him. They, he brought together labor, um, social movement labor, as well as business unionism labor. But these folks weren't hanging out together. So um, none of these candidates, all of whom are quite qualified, can say, you know, we're going to take the Walsh coalition. Rather, it's how do we chip away at it? Um, I think Anissa George has been um, most straightforward in trying to get uh, the police uh, the police union um, and, you know, to take that lane. Now she's used more progressive rhetoric, but she's housed in Dorchester. So she's trying to take uh, that lane that perhaps doesn't spoken to enough. Um, Janie uh, takes the lane of, uh, I, I think she can appeal to just about everybody. Um, people, I think, started out rooting for her. Um, you know, uh, Michelle Wu, uh, come to college campus. Michelle Wu is the progressive darling. She has, uh, first they went for Bernie, then they went for Ed Markey, and now they're for her. So I think, you know, all of these candidates are trying to tap into lanes, but it's important to remember, I, I generally think political consultants get wildly overpaid. Don't tweet at me if you're one of them. Um, but they are earning their money right now. Uh, because there's no playbook for this race. And importantly, usually you can go after your other candidate. You can really, you know, try to stick it to them metaphorically in politics. But guess what? Most people like two or three uh, candidates in this race. So you have to try to stake out a lane without offending people and trying to be um, the best amongst the top three, as opposed to, you know, putting the other two completely down. So I think that's a campaigning challenge that they all have. Yeah, and I think, <laughs> no, I just wanted that last point that you said that people are really stuck between like two or three different candidates right now. I hear that across the city, across ideological lanes, swimming lanes, if you will. I'm going to stop with these metaphors because I'm not very good at them. Um, <laughs> You've got two, Lisa, come on. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, I hear it. there are progressives who are stuck between Michelle and Andrea and, and Kim for different reasons. There are you know, different communities among Boston that are stuck between different candidates right now. No one, you know, as Aaron kind of said, is knit together that Walsh coalition. Um, you know, labor is kind of splintered between different candidates or are sitting, some of the biggest labor unions have sat this out so far. Um, so yeah, there, there's lanes, but I think it's a little more convoluted than that right now. I want to go back to the idea of people being split between Andrea and Michelle and Kim. When I think about, and Lisa, you wrote about the JP progressives struggling to figure out who they were going to get behind. Yeah. I sat and I thought about it for a while. And the comparisons between Kim Janey and Andrea Campbell are sort of obvious. One, Black women, two, similar experience being Boston natives who grow up and experience the sort of inequality that's the center of the race right now. Um, but then I thought about Michelle Wu and Andrea Campbell and the two of them politically resemble each other a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the issue right now that people are facing. Um, that's, that's exactly it. I couldn't have, <laughs> that's the thing is I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, you have, two, you know, more progressive women who come from very, you know, similar, but also very different life circumstances, but kind of that, you know, tougher upbringings within Boston and different, um, you know, very lived, deeply lived personal experiences that they've both been through. Um, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, in a recent article I did on the mayor's race for Politico, that city councilor Ricardo Arroyo, who has endorsed um, acting mayor Janey, he pointed that out, that there's that kind of, you know, 
people are looking for people with like that really lived experience. And that came up in, um, you know, in conversations with progressives across the city, but then you're also looking, especially with progressives looking for that detailed policy. And that's where people really gravitate towards Michelle and also Andrea. Um, you know, they've both been in this race the longest they both, you know, have really detailed policies and different and similar, you know, overlapping in some different issue areas that they really focus on. So people really drill down into that. Um, uh, as well, which uh, makes it tough, as you said. Jarea, you know, um, since you just asked about the, the three candidates who are pushing change relative to the rest of the field, I want to ask about the two candidates who are casting themselves largely as inheritors of Walsh's legacy. I'm curious, and I'd love to hear what any of you have to say about this. Why is it that Anissa Asabi George's push to cast herself as an inheritor to Marty Walsh has been successful, or at least has has let her be in the mix of people who are taken seriously in this race. And that for John Barrows, conversely, uh, he hasn't been able to do that, even though he served in the Walsh administration. And we've seen, you know, polling can be wrong, obviously, but we've seen his poll numbers consistently in the low single digits, which has led a lot of people to conclude it's a four-person race rather than a five-person race. So to shut myself up, why Anissa Asabi George and why not John Barrows if you're a Walsh fan? This is a great question. Um, I think a couple of things. One, Anissa Asabi George didn't come to the Walsh camp first as a competitor and then sign on in the way that Barrows did. Um, she will tell you. I don't, I don't think that she used the word political mentor, but she will tell you that she worked Walsh's campaign, and I believe she met her husband when she was working on Walsh's campaign. And oh, I didn't know that. Leaned on him and his understanding for um, getting a feel for Boston. I think also they're from the same place, this section of Dorchester where sometimes John Barros will say, as a young man, I didn't feel welcome going into certain parts of Boston, I was chased out. I've actually observed him on the campaign trail where other Black men will approach him and recall the same sort of thing. And I think if you live in that neighborhood and you're familiar with those people, especially in a city like Boston, a city of neighborhoods, for the neighbors to know you, that's already a built-in sort of constituency that you can access yeah. right off the bat. Um, it I hear I someone agree. chiming in. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with that. And I was thinking too, they, they also had different roles. Um, you know, John Burroughs was an economic development within the Walsh administration. That means you hobnob with some people with deep pockets, mm -hmm. but you're not in the community the same way. Anissa mm -hmm. George has run several races for city council. You know, she lost the first time. She built a constituency that she could instantly go back. And John Burroughs hadn't run since 2013. So I think, uh, okay. you know, to Lisa's point and prior points that a lot of people like John Burroughs, they like several individuals, but they know Anissa George better. She's been uh, and uh, she's visited the house more recently, if you will. I think too, the campaign issue of economic development, especially as people are thinking about how to recover from COVID, Barros was the steward of that. And right before Walsh left, everybody will recall that the city released that commission report that showed exactly how bad Boston has been with right. minority um, business owners trying to distribute city dollars evenly among everybody who lives and works here. And I think Barrows has to answer for that in a way that the other candidates do not. If you're Walsh adjacent, that's one thing. If you were part of the house. <laughs> that's a great um, point. Uh, and I think, you know, to be very quick about it, John Burrows on a college campus is neoliberal. Uh, and that's that. That's not a label you want. So th those words. folks, it is. But those those students, those young people, are uh, with Wu or some of the other progressives. Lisa, do you have any thoughts on the the question of um, why Barrows didn't catch fire, relatively speaking, and and Asabi George did? Yeah, I think it's uh, the natural constituency thing seems to be a major factor. You know, as we've already discussed in this race as a whole. I mean, you see it with. Michelle Wu being on top of the polls, you know, this whole time she had the widest base. She's run citywide before. Anissa Sabi George brings the same to the table. Um, 
you know, John Barrows had run before in 2013, but, you know, didn't finish that high either then. So, and didn't run in the interim, as you guys have noted. So that, you know, it's, it's really that natural constituency thing. It's, you know, again, polls can be wrong. There's a lot of people undecided at this point. And, you know, this race could change a lot in the next, are we down to only two weeks, three weeks? (laughs) I'm losing track. Uh, Two weeks now. Um, But yeah, I do think that that it is that natural constituency that plays are like more people just know Anissa and are comfortable. And she does have that degree of separation a little bit from the actual practices of the Walsh administration while she, she still brings that familiarity to the table. So we've talked about different pitches that they're all making. What are the biggest distinctions between what they would actually do if they're elected in terms of policies they would implement, uh, whether or not, or policies they'd pursue? I'm thinking here of rent control, which is something that the mayor can't just snap their fingers and implement. But, uh, you know, Michelle Wu has backed it. Kim Janey seems to be a, maybe a late convert to the idea, although it's a little bit squishy. So to your minds, um, what are the big differences we'd see emerge depending on who wins? Like what's something, for example, that, uh, that Anissa Sabi George would do that no one else would or vice versa. Well, she would expand the number of police. Yep. That that's the biggest one. Uh, um, that's the biggest policy difference I, I can think of just straight off the board. Um, most of the, all the other candidates are running to say major reforms, fewer police, uh, divert money to social services and uh, diversion programs and other things like that. So that is a major difference. Now, uh, tellingly, Anissa George has borrowed some of the language of progressives to say these would be community police officers. It's not a, you know, get tough on crime, broken windows approach. But nonetheless, saying I want 200 to 300 more police is a big difference compared to the other four candidates. And sticking with sticking with Anissa Sabi George, I think she's been consistent and vocal about maintaining an appointed school committee, even though most, if not all of the other candidates have signaled they're open to hybrid and maybe even fully elected. How about Kim Janey? Is there anything that if she is able to secure a full elected term, anything that she would do that sets her apart from the rest of the field? I think your questions are the right ones, Adam. And the reason at least I'm hoping someone else would go is because they're not that different. Like you're like you're 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 pulling for things that aren't there, my friend. <laughs> that's, and and, and that's, I say that with love. <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. But I think that's how voters feel. You know, that I is, mean, yes, some differences on climate. Um, and, and I'm sure if you ask the candidates, of course, they're going to say they're very different. But as you know, someone who, who watches politics, you know, professionally, uh, the biggest difference I can think are, are, are the two that have already been covered. The, you know, most voters aren't policy nerds like us. And um, so it's more personality. And that's- it is personality. But I know that if we have Michelle Wu supporters listening to this podcast, they're going to they're going to get apoplectic if we don't acknowledge to harken back to rent control, for example, that even though she didn't used to be a rent control supporter way back in the day, she's been one since the outset of this campaign. Whereas Janie has indicated that she'd like to, to have communities have the, the authority to implement rent control, but seems overall less aggressive. And I, I think I'd say less committed to it than Wu does. So there are some distinctions, although you're right. I mean, the overall worldview, this isn't like a a Kevin White and Louise Day Hicks kind of situation. The overall worldview, the kind of things they want in Boston generally are similar, but there are those differences. Yeah, I mean, that's... (laughs) That's kind of the thing that, you know, as as Aaron said, that a lot of people are struggling with in this is that, yeah, everyone wants to do something about, you know, the increasing affordability of housing in, uh, in uh, Boston, and but they do have slightly different ways to go about it, like, um, you know, rent stabilization, or pursuing more affordable housing, um, or combinations of all of these things, same thing with the school committee, and same thing with like, um, Massachusetts Avenue and Melania Cass Boulevard. I mean, everyone has a plan for that, but the plans are are slightly different. Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's interesting and hard to, you have to really get into the weeds to get to some of the differences between them. Soraya, you want to hop in here with any questions for our esteemed guests? There was a plane passing over and things were rumbling. <laughs> so I muted myself. Planes, trains, and automobiles here. 
I want to go back to Peter's thought about Janie really distinguishing herself with her last action with the waterfront. I feel like, and check me y'all, I feel <laughs> like it's really Anissa Asabi George that's swimming in her own lane in this race. Again, when we think about differentiating herself on the police issue, um, with the school committee, with pushing for um, mental health providers or social workers in schools. I think, I think she's the, the one. I would agree with that. That's, that is kind of how it shakes out because I feel like John Barrows kind of swims in between some of these lanes a little bit, whereas Anissa is kind of, you know, and, and just, especially in this very progressive leaning field, that's how it's played out. I definitely agree with that. And it looks like, you know, she's had some, now some of the polls that were released were released um, by her own campaign. So, you know, you're only going to release the good ones, but it looks like Anissa George is, um, you know, moved into that uh, second spot. Uh, earlier in the summer, it really felt like it was going to be a woo and Janie that emerged on the 14th. And um, I think smart money remains on woo, but that second spot is really up in the air and uh, it could be sort of a late break by uh, Anissa George. Um, and, you know, I think she ha- having run and run, you know, citywide, she's uh, going to have the ability to get people to the polls because that's going to be really hard. We always say GOTV matters, but this time it does. Um, yeah, there, uh, uh, in political science, we used to have this theory of breakage effects when you're pulled in different ways that you don't vote. But, and, and so some voters, I think, will stay home, ironically, because they like too many candidates. So um, getting your people to the polls, if you've run citywide and have shown your ability to mobilize, that's going to make a big difference. We have to go pretty soon. Does anyone have any last points that they wanted to get out when it comes to how these candidates are differentiating themselves that you haven't had a chance to so far? I have a completely different point. <laughs> uh, it, yes, in part because I, uh, I'm putting together my syllabi right now. Uh, we start school in a week, so I'm teaching women in politics. And I'm definitely struck by the progression in Boston history that uh, the city council has been the place where diversity has occurred in elective office. The um, uh, uh, become the path breakers and the slide here shows that four of the individuals running are a part of that diverse city council. And uh, we know, of course, Ayanna Presley, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley emerged from the council and they had really been um, a critical mass, a bit of a sisterhood. Um, breaking up the white guy establishment in Boston politics, at least the hold on the council. And I'm struck by, I, you know, I'm going to leave, I'm going to make my students answer the question because I'm ambivalent um, that hood has frayed <laughs> in, in terms of, you know, running for all, when you have to run against someone, yeah, you're going to be tough on them. Um, we saw some moves by the council in June, sort of reminding Janie that she's acting and we can take their power. Um, and so that, 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 the, the original squad, if you will, has um, frayed because they all want the same spot. And that's, you know, maybe that's a good thing for women in politics that you don't have to link arms and always be solidarity and stuff like that. But nonetheless, um, the women can fight just as tough as the men and they are in this race. That's a great point. And, you know, back when some of these candidates were running together, uh, you'd hear them referring to their sisters in service. And you hear a lot of talk about sisters in service right now. All right, Lisa, you get the last word here. Any closing bits of wisdom you want to leave us with? Oh, um, wow. I really, I just want to hit home that this race could still, you know, I feel like it's been so steady for so long now and just going in a totally different track than what we were just talking about that, um, I still feel like this could really uh, change a lot in the next couple of weeks and that there really could be some late surges by some of these candidates and that as soon as we come back from Labor Day, I mean, this sprint, uh, this last week to the finish line is is going to be real. There's, you know, uh, multiple debates and stuff like that coming up. It's it's going to be really exciting. And I think we could be surprised about who makes it into that that final two. All right. The race is fluid. <laughs> <laughs> all come down well played. Um, Lisa Kashinsky, Aaron O'Brien, and Saraya Wintersmith, thank you for joining me for this conversation. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Enjoyed it as well. And thank all of you. Thanks to all of you for either watching or listening to this iteration of the Scrum. 
As always, we would like to hear from you. You can find us via email. We're at scrum at wgbh.org. You can also find us on Twitter. I'm at Riley Adam. Peter Kadzis is at Kadzis. And Soraya, you are? Swintersmith. Swintersmith. The Scrum is a production of GBH News. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks again. I'm back next week. <laughs>